Dowell, uh, again, coming off a of bye week, uh, you know, any major tweaks, things that you said, okay, we've got to do this better and really concentrate it on, or was it business as usual? No, you always go back and you, you split it between self-scout and getting ready for Texas A&M, and um, you want to make sure that you've looked at all your tendencies you have, make sure you're playing to all your strengths, um, go through and try to figure out why good things are happening, why bad things are happening, and then you fix them. You know, we were a little, the schedule was a little bit different this week. We uh, we gave the players or the last but then the last bye week we uh, dove in on Monday to just football, and uh, the players were they had the day off, so we were able to grind through um, probably more than we were the last bye week. So we we're pleased with um, where we're at this point with the uh, the work that we got during that time. We, I, I feel like we improved and got better at some some areas, and there's definitely improvement that's needed. And you know, I feel I feel good about where we're at right now with that. Hey, Dal, as you guys head into this final five-game stretch of the year, what do you feel like ideally for you would be the next step for this offense to take? Yeah, win this game, play well in this game. I understand the question, but in five weeks, like this is one week for us. We're playing a heck of an opponent, um, a really good defense that's really good at stopping the run. They're really good at uh, creating turnovers. They're really good at rushing the passer. So we're not thinking about past – 10 minutes from now and starting to study the red area and making sure we're doing the things to put our offense and our players in position to be successful. When you have an opponent that's good at those things, and there have been times when, when you all struggled with some of those things, how do you try to balance figuring out uh, – the right way to go about you know preparing for a team like that. Yeah, I don't think anyone's figured it out yet because Texas ain't, or LSU's got two first round tackles and they struggled against this team. Uh, it's a really good team. It's really really talented. Um, you got to make sure that uh, you maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses, and make sure that you got the everyone has a plan to handle the details of the assignments. And you you got to you know the bye week you do a little bit in Texas a and but not a ton because you're really working against your own defense and it's more good on good than it is when you practice. You're not ahead that way. But um, when you dive into the plan, making sure that you're doing the things that your guys do well and the things that you struggle with, you're trying to take out because this is a good team that can attack and they can, they are gonna, they're going to cause stress like they have for the last eight weeks in this league. When you have a player like Jared who you know what he can do, but he's coming off a big injury, and Shane said yesterday he's going to play Saturday, do you try to get him involved early? Do you just as easy as just popping him back in? How do you kind of go about ramping him up after he's missed almost a month now? Yeah, it's a great question. We definitely missed his presence out there. Um, you you kind of, There's a feel for it as well, and there's like he's got to go practice and do those things, and um, he's transitioning back into practice, and he is – um, looks like he is going to be able to play in this game and transition into that stuff. So you go back to getting him back to feeling comfortable in the things that, that are asked of him. You know, he has missed a lot of time, and uh, there's a physical toll that happens with that. There's rust that happens with that. There's also a mental toll of, like, hey, making sure you're caught up to speed because the offense has changed since – a little bit since you've played and making sure that we got another weapon that we're using the correctly and then making sure that the volume of work is not just the volume of work he can handle because all of a sudden if he isn't able to handle it then you got to make sure that you have plan b and the pieces around him there's not new, uh, too much stress passed out on those guys as well um I, around the country if like there's a an offense struggling it seems like quarterbacks will do a lot of bootlegs and just kind of split the field in half you guys run a lot of the the triple option does it do essentially the same thing when you're running the triple option of uh just giving your offensive line some breathing room a little bit yeah it's definitely it is you got to make them defend 53 and a third as well and so there's different ways to do it last year we we moved the pocket a little bit more with Spence because he threw so well on the run um, also, so you have to find different ways to do that, whether it's perimeter throws, whether it's triple options, whether it's zone reads. Um, those things have been good for the for us. Um, we've had a couple exchange issues that well, obviously we need to clean up, um, but there's different ways to – you got to find those ways to attack 53 and a third, and that has been our method of it right now because we are getting – we do get more nine technique. We do get more zone read. So you're getting more mess charges where the defensive end is rushing at the quarterback. So boots and nakeds and all those things aren't as advantageous to your offense as doing some different things like triple option. Yeah. Really good question. The last time we spoke to you, you talked a lot about how you guys need to do a better job of taking care of the football and not putting it in harm's way. You guys had zero turnovers against Oklahoma last time out. What do you feel like was the reason for the limiting the turnovers in that game? 
Yeah, it's. I think it's the reason that we were we weren't happy necessarily. We were happy we won the game. Um, you know, it turned into a game that got lopsided real fast, and you get you get frustrated because you feel like you lose your edge a little bit when you're looking out there and it's twenty one nothing in the first quarter. And um, you know, I thought I was okay with the way we played in the first half, but I didn't. I wasn't happy with the way we played in the second half, and I thought we lost our edge a little bit and lost a little intensity um, to finish out that game because the game was it was out of hand and lopsided early. But it's what I am happy with is. We knew that that game, they, I think they were seventh in the country in creating turnovers. We knew that that game wouldn't be won on third down, but it could be lost on third down. When you go back and watch, like, that's, a really good, that's a really good defense. They played really well the next week against Ole Miss. Um, you go back and watch the Auburn game. If Auburn doesn't turn the ball over, they're going to probably get out of that thing with a win. Um, and Oklahoma was able to create some turnovers on third down. So I give a lot of credit to Lenore of taking care of the football. That is a big emphasis for us because if you can – our style of play right now – is if you run the ball well and you're taking care of the ball, then you're going to have a chance to be in every game in the fourth quarter and have a chance to win in the end. And we knew that what the thing that slowed us down a little bit was the turnovers. So to it's fundamentals, it's technique, it's emphasizing all those things that our guys did out and, uh, went out and executed and did a really good job with. And it was a, a major point of going on the road and getting a win versus a really good defense. It seemed like with – a and M in the LSU game that things really turned in the second half when when they started turning turning the ball over on their end. Obviously, you always want to emphasize that, but yeah, is it even more so just because you have something real recent to to look back to to say, hey, we can't we can't get into that, can't start doing that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like you you can see most of the time when you win the turnover battle, um, that you're gonna have a chance to be in the game at the end and have you're gonna win more than you lose. And you go back and you look, and LSU's a really good offense and they're playing really well and they've they're up 10 points and then all of a sudden in the second half they come out and you start feeling the pass rush and you start feeling that, that then they start heating them up and they're starting to come after them and you saw a really experienced quarterback turn the ball over and put the ball in jeopardy and that's when you play these teams I call them racers that have these NFL game like these NFL players and all these scouts when you go out there and you see 25 scouts a game you're like all right we we know what type of guys that they these guys have um, they have racers and they can get home and they can rush the passer really really well when you have speed and you can rush the passer, most of the time it creates turnovers because that creates stress. Speed creates stress on offenses. Speed on offense creates stress on defenses. So it's doing the same thing of protecting the ball. But there's a fine line because I think I've told you guys this story. Um, the Titans in 2011, we signed Matt Hasselbeck, who had the opportunity to play for Pete Carroll. And you guys, everyone adapts this philosophy, the ball is a program. The ball is a program. They're talking about ball security and, and getting turnovers. Well – and he said to me, he's like, hey, the, he's like, I love Seattle. It was a great, great opportunity playing for Coach Carroll. It was so cool. Great motivator, great leader of men, had a vision for his program. But he said, when I was, as a quarterback, he goes, I, I, I had this analogy used as a golfer. He goes, if I tell you right before you're about to putt, don't leave it short, what are you going to do? You're going to leave it short. So then you're telling your quarterback, hey, don't turn it over. Take care of the ball. Well, now you're taking away some of their aggressiveness. You're taking away some of their – um, ability to make plays off schedule. So it's a fine line of, but you got to coach technique. You got to make sure that you double in trouble. Like when there's two guys around you that you're covering the ball, that you have the right points of pressure, that as a quarterback, you know when the journey's over. Like you know when to throw the ball away. You got to win, win every, you want to end every series with a kick, whether it be a field goal, an extra point, or a punt. Like punting's okay in some of these games in these SEC defensive matchups that, like, <clears throat> Where you start watching this thing in the game, like you get in these pass, pass situations, third and ten pluses, third and seven pluses, and this uh, coach Elko, unbelievable at attacking protections and blitzes, like does a great job, as good as anyone that in college football that I've watched in four years now. So it's there's a fine line of taking care of the ball, being aggressive. We always tell the Norse, be aggressive as hell in the timing of the play. When the play starts to, when you're hit, like you're, we talk about coaching through their uh, through their feet. The feet leave the eyes. So now it's, hey, one hitch there, two hitch there, three hitches, check the ball down. And so it's learning the timing. So all of that plays into taking care of the football as well. Hey, Dal, you just mentioned the Titans. I wanted to ask you a question going back to when you were with the Bears and you had Alshon Jeffrey. Yeah. Now, is anybody – Any way we can get him back for this week? 
<laughs> well, Jeez. I, I was going to try to ask you, with the current wide receiver group that you have, are there any individual attributes that any individual receivers have where you watch them out on the field and you say, hey, he does that thing the way Alshon used to do it? Alshon was – he was so unique, though, because he was a 6'2", and he had elite ball skills. And I, I tell the quarterbacks this all the time. Like, we talk about nap throws, non-aggressive posture throws. We had Brian Hoyer – Cutler had gotten hurt, and Hoyer comes in and plays. And he's like, hey, Alshon's always covered. I'm like, throw it, throw it, throw it. Give him an opportunity ball, a nap throw. It's a non-aggressive posture. His back's turned to him. He can't see the ball. And Brian, Brian wanted to see him open. And Cutler had so much feel for Alshon. He's like, Alshon's never covered. He's like, and then Hoyer's like, he's never open. And he's like, he's never covered because he's 6'2", and he's got these long arms with elite ball skills. So if you put it eye level one yard outside and that DB's got his back turned, Al's going to go pluck it out of the sky. I mean, he was an elite, elite ball skill guy. Um, obviously so proud of him and what he's accomplished. Still a, a close friend, a guy that I love, I love talking to, you know, still talk to him to this day. But, I mean, to compare someone to Alshon Jeffries' names on the freaking stadium, it'd be like comparing someone's – the term winner to Connor Shaw. Like, guy never lost a game in Willie B. It's just hard. Like, when you talk about these great ones, like each one of them has individual strengths. I'm not going to compare anyone to Alshon because I would never take anything away from how gifted Al is and um, the worker that he was and the, the guy he was. Like, you get me excited when I start to get talk about my former player and get talk about Alshon and Connor and those guys because – and I had both of them at the same time in Chicago. And it's, um, you know, to, each one of our guys has um, skills uh, that we have to use differently. Um, I'm not going to compare anyone to Alshon right now, but I think it's a good it's a good name to chase. The last time he was here in town, I made him come out and talk to our skill guys and just absolute stud. And if you guys know of any young Alshons, send them our way, please. The, uh, the bye week is just this – thing to fans that all of a sudden just the entire thing can just be reinvented entire offense can just be changed but what what actually is able to happen in a bye week I mean do you feel like it can just be a, a couple tweaks and making sure guys are just doing the things correctly and that can fix things a little bit you know there's um there's a term that you like hey you got to get through hard things well you don't get through hard things you grow through hard things and you have to you have to take that mindset there are no overnight fixes. There aren't. Like, I wish there were. Um, but you take what you're doing well, and you keep trying to – you try to identify that, which is the hardest thing sometimes in coaching is to say, hey, this is what we do well. This is what we're not doing well. Let's do more of this and less of that. But, like, you also minimizing these mistakes. And so, like, the time with the buy is – and it's different. In pro football, it was a week. You just sat in there, you just grinded tape. Well, in college football – you practice twice first the defense, and then you're gone recruiting for two days. So it's less football, but in that time when you do have, you're trying to grind through and figure out, like, hey, can we, is there two things we can give Lenore to improve on um, each individual player? You're thinking, hey, is there a scheme that maybe we need to incorporate more of this um, to give ourselves a better chance? Or, hey, we've been heavy on this, and we're not as good. Sometimes week to week you get lost in the moment of, what has been successful versus what you like, or you're talking to Lenoris and or some of the other players and saying, Hey, how do you guys feel about things? Like, what do you guys have confidence in? And you start, you look at everything. You look at the, you know, the yards per carry of each play of each pass and you grind through those things and you figure out maybe we thought this was going to fit us and it really doesn't versus, Hey, we need to do more of this. We're better than we thought as we work on our individual um, as a coaching staff, our schemes on top of some of the things we need to clean up fundamentally, like why are sacks happening? When what situations are they happening in? Or is it is it the O line? Is it tight end? Is it quarterback? Is it the running backs? Like are there repeat offenders? Do we need to look at a, a roster change? If something keeps happening over multiple times, then like hey, these repeat offenders, like we either had to fix this problem or we need to look and see can we create competition in a position. So you do all those things in a three-day window. Um, it's not really a bye week for coaches. Like everyone says, oh, bye week. It's not because you're drinking through a fire hydrant again because you're trying to manage self-scout, your next opponent, and recruiting, and your own players all in, all in one week. So it's good to like take a little breath there because there's like what creates stress in coaching is time restraints. But you create stress in life. It, you guys have deadlines and you're busting your butt to try to get a deadline done. Well, same thing in coaching. In the bye week, it allows you to work a little bit longer with no time restraints. Questions, coach? All right. Thanks.
Appreciate you guys.